Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we'll be delving into more true and terrifying tales. Before we get started, though, if you have a true scary story that you would like to share, go to ravenreadshorror.com forward slash pages forward slash story, and you can submit your story there. You can also check out the shop while you're there. The other shop I have is SpookyLovely.com, which is the apparel and Teespring shop. I'm updating the designs there pretty much all the time, so keep checking it out to see if there's something you might like. As always, links to Patreon and anything you might need, including the other channels and podcasts, are always in the description below. But without further ado, you know what time it is. It's time to get comfortable. Grab a beverage of choice and get ready to take another journey into the night. I'm from California, and way back when I was on the college search. I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop, so my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old, run-down overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees, so my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, Yoo-hoo. I kid you not, 
When I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yoohoo, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though, as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. 
For about three weeks, we stayed at the OZ bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and I'm still at least two miles from civilization, and that civilization in reality was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music, more specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place. Unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue. The music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, 
the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction. It was just gone. Suddenly everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now since I was the only one in the cabin I decided to lock the door to my room, just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember, though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. 
Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted. Like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams, and I'm in no rush to see it again. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service, besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21-year-old female in my second year of nursing, and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two-bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park, and at night, when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime, but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs, and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home it was roughly 10pm. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods, until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful, and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset, when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second, and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter, because it was light enough to see the sky, and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. 
It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double checking the doors and windows when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window i curled to the ground gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place and that's how i fell asleep that night i left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else if anyone has any clue what's going on or what this thing is and can tell me what i can do let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. I was just thinking of an experience I had one weekend this past summer. I've had many extremely dark paranormal experiences, but this wasn't one of them. It was still emotionally intense and profound in its own way though. I was at an outdoor music festival in Virginia in the United States. It was on an old farm. The property was huge with big rolling fields and a few various small buildings littered about. After that evening's show got called off due to threatening electrical storms and crazy strong wind, I started walking across a field toward a little old shack set back among a few trees. The setting was surreal, like out of a movie. The sky was swirling and churning with dark gray-black clouds. The wind was strong, but felt very refreshing after a hot, sunny, sweaty day. The electricity in the air was palpable. Everything felt slightly charged. As I started walking into the middle of the field, suddenly everybody was gone. I couldn't see or hear a single person from the festival. I kept walking across the field to the shack and I was feeling very heavy emotionally. There was a definite presence, not malevolent, but heavy. When I got to the shack, I collapsed on my knees and I began weeping and apologizing repeatedly. This went on probably for a few minutes, but it felt like it was happening outside of time. It felt to me at this point, like I was addressing formerly enslaved people who had lived and worked on the property. It was like they were all around me. Eventually I stood up. I felt pleasantly exhausted after a big emotional release. I still hadn't seen or heard anyone from the festival since I had first walked away from them. I began walking back slowly toward the field where my car was and the rain started pouring down. 
I soaked it all in as I walked back to my car. That night, after it became clear that the storm was going to prevent any further music from happening, I drove back to my motel room in heavy rain. I was awake in bed at 3 a.m. or so, when I heard a creaking noise that turned out to be the mini fridge door slowly opening. I got up to check it out. I thought maybe the magnet on the mini fridge was weak, but it wasn't. It was very strong. There was no way this thing opened on its own. So I knew that something was there with me. I wasn't quite confident yet in my ability to assess the situation accurately on the spot. So I was feeling a bit leery and self-protective. But as some time went by, I grew more relaxed and I sensed that the spirit was not malevolent. I sensed that she was a female spirit of a formerly enslaved person who had followed me back to my motel room. The energy in the room wasn't dark or ominous. It was like a mixture of sorrow, exhaustion, curiosity, and relief. I looked up the history of the property that the festival was being held at, and I confirmed that the property had been home to many enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. I found myself wishing that I had been more comforting and explicitly accepting of her during those first few hours. I hope she was able to pass on after our encounter. In a way, I feel like she followed me back from the farm before she chose to pass on, because I was a curiosity to her, or maybe because I had shown kindness. Something that makes this experience stand out to me is that I rarely encounter human spirits like this. Mostly, I only encounter human spirits remotely through other people. My immediate radius is always so full of other non-human entities that I think most human spirits just steer clear. But there are a few things about the way this encounter unfolded that I think allowed for it to happen as it did. I had driven 12 hours to get there on the previous day, so there wasn't the usual residual dark energy just hanging around from the get-go. I also feel like the intense swirling electrical wind and rainstorms that surrounded the festival for multiple days created a unique situation energetically. Either way, it was an emotional experience, and it felt cleansing. I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man. So I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time. My father and I found him in his rocking chair with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things, doors opening that shouldn't be, unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots, like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? 
I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold. I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different, almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night, stupid, I know, and I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though, not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks really, but nothing happened. In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better. And they were, for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. About five years ago, when I was 14, my best friend and I, both female, went for a walk on a hiking route in our village. We had always known that it existed, but we'd never gone there, so we didn't know how long the hike would take. About halfway through, it started to get really dark outside. The route was a road through the woods that had no street lights whatsoever. So we called one of our guy friends that had a crosser bike to come so that we wouldn't be alone. He came and we continued our walk in complete darkness. He turned off the bike because it was loud and decided to just push it. We didn't use our flashlights because the moonlight illuminated our path. As we were walking and talking, I heard something about 20 feet away in the woods that sounded like a loud scream through crying. I immediately stopped and looked at my friends because I thought I was the only one who had heard it, but their terrified looks told me that they had heard it too. The two of them jumped on the bike and I ran after them to the first streetlight. Yeah, I know, they left me behind. We were panicking and trying to find an explanation for that sound. 
maybe some kind of animal? Until I remembered a story about the Drekovac. I live in Balkan, and I don't think the name has a translation, but I guess I would call it maybe a howler or a screamer. Basically, it's a mythology creature characteristic in the Balkans, and there are probably 20 different beliefs as to what it is. This is the only paranormal thing that has ever happened to me, and to this day, I get goosebumps when I tell the story to somebody, because I remember it like it happened yesterday. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform. Think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange.
Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from Eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we live. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times, the longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak magic or Vlaska Magica, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house, about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night, he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him, until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past, of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state, 
where you question everything and think about the world. So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool. So we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird, 
and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic. One that I've never felt before in any forest. And I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks and suddenly we hear crunching coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers but I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that slow, creepy smile while slightly undulating. I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. 
She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing. So eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area with a tiny Western town about a mile away, and that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 PM. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate. So the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills. And we noticed this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. I was on patrol one night in my town and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on. And at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops, just gone. 
The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood though, nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours, and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air, and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight, and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. 
Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington, jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw, but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might've seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments, then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. 
I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and that he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam. It takes a lot to scare me though, 
and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods, or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m., and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, people could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race. And he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area, with a tiny western town about a mile away, and that's it for miles. We had just arrived for our 10-day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park, as she was really into photography, and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate, and so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road, over the park, above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere it took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then, nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. I still have no idea what we saw. This was back when I was living with my mom, aunt, and brother. We lived in a townhouse. It was like a large house with a smaller house inside of it. My aunt owned the house, so she was alone in the larger house, which was two floors, 
and my mom and I lived in the smaller house. We shared the bedroom, and my brother lived in the basement. One night, my mom was in the living room watching TV. I couldn't tell you what show, but she really only watches old sitcoms, so it's a dead giveaway that this couldn't have been the TV. My brother worked as a landscaper, so by this hour he was almost always fast asleep. Our bedroom has an outside facing wall, facing the very large fenced in backyard, and behind it a small stretch of woodland bordered by a reservoir. There isn't any room for anything larger than a coyote to live there, and nothing larger is native to the area, considering that we live in the suburbs. There are mountain lions a little over an hour north, but wolves and other predators are not native at all. Around 1 a.m., I heard this blood-curdling scream. Before you say anything, yes, I am aware of mountain lion screams, and I've listened to them extensively, but this was absolutely not a mountain lion. It wasn't a fox either, or any other animal that I could think of that we have here, but I'm open to suggestions if you think you know any. It goes on for a good 10 or so minutes, while I lay paralyzed with fear. It sounds almost like children screaming, except deeper and more terrified. It genuinely sounded like someone being killed. The next morning, I asked my mom about it, and she said she didn't hear anything. My brother said that he did, but he thought that I was just up watching TV, or that maybe my aunt was fighting with her boyfriend. My aunt thought it was my mom having a temper tantrum. To this day, I don't know what it was, and though I don't live there anymore, it still makes me very afraid. I will preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth, and I'd been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I became. But this happened last night, and I can now firmly say that I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail, and right away, something was off. One of my friends has always experienced the paranormal, and he was extremely uncomfortable. He said he was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I couldn't see out of the ordinary, so we kind of laughed it off and said that he was just scared, which I now regret doing. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worst. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them that I did not feel. I assumed they just had anxiety. Then my ghost seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one and he said yes. I looked into the woods and I saw it. It was a small wispy figure that had a white gray coloration and seemed to be made out of smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion, inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure. Not childlike, just small, and it would wave. I pointed at it and I asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing. And he said, oh my gosh, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread that my other two friends felt, and I could not shake the feeling for the rest of the night. It's all I can think about now. I mean, what was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. I mean, it didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel like it was mocking us. More like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it. Like it was trying to be human. I don't know. I'm an ex-skeptic that's now begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing. And all three of us felt the same thing. So if you have any idea what that was, I'm all ears.
My boyfriend and I went up to his parents' cabin a few years ago. We were the only ones up there for the weekend. We went on a short hike up along a creek known as the Strawberry Trail. We were about a half a mile up just enjoying the beautiful scenery. We embraced in a hug and we both closed our eyes as we did so. But as soon as we did, we heard this loud flapping of wings or running of some large animal. It was so loud that we could feel the vibrations and a sort of wind that came with it. It felt like the animal or thing had stopped right in front of us. I was so terrified I kept my eyes closed, but as soon as I opened them, we both looked around and there was nothing there. We didn't hear it leave, and trust me, we would have. We were spooked, so we booked it back to the cabin. It was around 10 p.m. and my friends and I decided that it was a good idea to play hide and seek at 11 p.m. So when we started to play, I ran into the middle of the forest where I hid. Around a tree, I saw a woman in a white dress just staring at me. Obviously, I got scared and ran outside of the forest. On the way out, I got a cut that was about three or four inches long on my left hand. I only saw it when I was clear of the woods. When my friends got the balls to do it and go in there, they saw her too. We all ran to the highway, which was about 200 feet away. The night passed and we didn't play anymore, but I had a camera at home, which I didn't use anymore. I decided to put a 128 gigabyte SD card in it and place it near the tree that I had hid around to let it record anything. When my friend went to get it, he said that the woman appeared on the camera until 3 a.m. when she suddenly disappeared. Unfortunately, we have since lost the footage, but either way, it was a very scary experience. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him. We ran after him and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost and we started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. Asked if we were okay, things like that. I told him how we'd been chasing my cousin and we lost him and we don't know how to get back home. He just smiles and says, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch, play with the children. And when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said, okay. So we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods in a clearing, but it had at least 60 people. We ate a stew or something like that that they made, and he had me draw in the dirt on the road where our house was. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live. If you want to play for a little bit, that's okay. But I want to get you home before dark. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats. Not good for children to be out in. So he took us home, and he didn't leave the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying she was about to call the cops because we were missing for about four or five hours. 
She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin. And I said, he was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind. We tried to call for him, but he was gone. Then he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened and she said we would figure it out the next day. The next day we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was almost nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me. It looked like it had just been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but there was no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I have ever had. My family used to go camping with a few group of friends when I was a kid. I remember one Christmas, when I was about five, we were camping out in the bush. There were nine kids in total at our campsite. We were allowed to wander through the bush if we wanted to. The parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp, and we never wandered far. Anyway, out of nowhere, an unfamiliar voice came over the walkies. It was a man's voice. He said he was Santa, and that he was trying to find us to give us our presents, and asked us to look for him. We all ran back to our campsite, excited to tell everybody that we had talked to Santa. The walkie-talkie was taken off of us, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of the trip. At the time, as kids, we were pretty devastated. But now, as an adult, I understand the seriousness and the creepiness of it, and I'm really glad that we didn't go looking for him. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent an old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe 10 yards, and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. 
I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was, because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, Three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends, so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped, which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, 
Hey! She didn't turn around, or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, Oi! And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white. But I looked at Nate and he just stood there, and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area but up until then, I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got, but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. I went for a casual night walk in the woods with my friend. We were walking along the path, along the river, and talking. Then we decided to stop for a while and sit on a bench that was right there next to the path facing the forest. The river was flowing behind us. We were sitting there for quite a while, just talking about random things. I suddenly started to hear a soft tinkling, like a small bell ringing, almost like a bicycle bell or a dog's leash, every now and then. I didn't pay much attention to it at first, but it kept getting closer and more frequent. So I told my friend about it. He confirmed that he could hear it too. So I started to listen a bit more closely. I looked in the direction that it was coming from, expecting to see somebody riding a bicycle or walking a dog at any second. That wouldn't be too unusual as we used to go there quite often, and even in the middle of the night, we would come across a few people going on a walk with their dog. The moon was shining brightly, so I could see a silhouette if there was a person coming toward us, but I could only hear the ringing, getting closer and more frequent. Out of nowhere, my gut told me that we should leave, so I told my friend and we started to walk away. I walked a little faster than usual, as I was a bit creeped out already, and after a while of not hearing a thing, it suddenly ringed about two meters away from us. We both just started running. We could hear it ring close behind us a few more times, and then it suddenly stopped. We could hear that we were getting away from it. When we got back to the city, we talked about it, and we realized we both heard it from different sides. I had clearly heard it coming from the left, but he heard it coming from the right. So how did we hear it coming from different directions? Only when it got close to us and we started running, could we hear it coming from the same place. The worst thing about it all is that both of us could hear it. So it couldn't be my imagination. That and I got that weird gut feeling of danger that I've never experienced before or since. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. 
a person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent and its occupant in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall, it wasn't a widow maker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent-sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. 
I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet taking tiny, shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days-old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I have heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was, I don't know. In our next story, Redditor Starry Alpha 2099 tells the story of the children they saw in the woods. At least, that's what they appeared to be. Here's the tale. When I was around 12 years old, I was at my cousin's house for a party. I'm pretty sure that it was around Christmas time. We were hanging out in their backyard and woods. Part of their backyard is a wooded area. And we came to this tree that used to have a treehouse in it. All that's left of that treehouse is some steps leading to it and a few platforms. It's not safe to get up on there, even if you can. My cousin, who was an eight-year-old boy at the time, told us this story about how the kids who had that treehouse had died when it collapsed. I personally thought it was a bunch of BS, but I just went along with it. We eventually headed back to the house, but I decided to go back into the woods alone. As I was walking into the woods, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me, like I was safe there, safer than anywhere else. As I'm walking, I'm looking around and I see a light blue and white checkered flag. It was up in a super thin tree that I hadn't noticed before. As I'm looking at this and trying to figure out how it got there, I started to hear kids' voices, laughing, talking, just having fun. I didn't think too much of it at the time, as my cousins were out in the treehouse, a, a new one that they had built, not the run-down one. As I'm walking closer to the old treehouse, the voices seem louder, and I look back up at the flag. It was billowing, despite there not being any wind. I shook it off as I couldn't feel wind from down there, but figured that maybe up where they were, there was a little. And that's when I saw them. Six children with white skin. Like snow white skin. Almost glowing. They all seemed to be wearing winter gear, though dull and dirty looking. They were walking toward me, but I didn't run. I wasn't afraid for some reason. I heard a branch snap and that's when I ran. As I went back toward my cousin's house, 
I was surprised to see that they weren't outside. I found them in the living room playing video games. When I asked them when they came in, they said, when you were walking in the woods, why? The kids I had heard weren't them. I still don't know to this day who those kids were. They weren't other neighbor kids. None of them lived close to my cousins. Were they just a figment of my imagination? Whoever it is, whatever they were, that incident is one of the reasons that I believe. I was camping up in Herber, Arizona with my brothers and my dad. I was 15 or so at the time, and we were deep in the woods, far from most other camps. My brothers and I had our own tent, whilst my dad had a separate one not far off. He likes to give us our privacy while we're camping. We would usually run around a bit at night before going to bed, entering our camp to sleep at about 11 o'clock p.m. One night, we were playing hide-and-seek when we heard a branch snap a few yards from us. We assumed it was an elk or something, since they were pretty common in our area. We would typically go to our tent if we saw one, in hopes of not agitating it. So that's what we did. I called for my youngest brother, who was still hiding, and he revealed himself to be hiding in a branch pile not super far from where the noise originated. We went to the tent anyway, and I decided that since it was already pretty late, we should just go to sleep. The next morning, I went to check the spot for elk prints, since I found them pretty fascinating. Instead, I found large cat prints. I knew they were cat prints because they had the four toe pads and the large center pad as well as no claw marks. I was honestly kind of excited. I had always wanted to see a mountain lion or a bobcat in the wild, but it never happened. Knowing that I was that close to either one was very thrilling. But it then occurred to me that my youngest brother was hiding, separated from us, scarily close to where those prints were found. It occurred to me that if it was a hungry mountain lion and it had taken notice of my six-year-old brother hiding alone, it could have possibly taken the chance. We stopped doing hide and seek at night to avoid those types of situations and we actually set up a roll call system to ensure that everybody was together at night. Now, I know a mountain lion likely wouldn't have done anything had it seen him, but still, the risk felt very real, and I worry that had I not heard it, I could have lost my brother that night. A few years ago, I was camping in the Serengeti as part of a safari I was doing. We had set up our tents in a designated camping area with a bathroom building. I'm from the States and had been camping and backpacking tons of times, but the Serengeti felt different. We could hear baboons from our tents for one. In the middle of the night, I had to pee, so I carefully unzipped my tent and started walking through the grass toward the bathrooms. Already, I was feeling a little jumpy. When I creaked open the bathroom door, a crap ton of bats flew over my head and out of the building. It felt like that scene in Batman Begins where young Bruce Wayne fell into the cave. I was just really hoping that nothing else was in the bathroom. It just felt really eerie. It ended up all right, but I was very glad to get back to my tent. On a separate trip, I was hiking through southern Ethiopia with a guide to a lake where we would be able to take a boat and see some hippos. It was quiet for the most part, but a portion of our hike took us through some brush and trees, and we started hearing this loud, gruesome moaning, and the whole forest felt still. We looked and looked to find out what was making the sound, and that's when we saw a massive baboon lying face down on the ground, dying. We gathered from its position that it must have fallen from a tree and seriously injured itself, and was now crying out in pain. Obviously, we kept our distance because we didn't know how it would react, 
or if any other animals would be nearby. The noise it made was both heartbreaking and terrifying. It had an almost spiritual quality to it. We moved on shortly after, but I'll forever remember how I felt watching this animal die alone in the forest. Honestly, it was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. My boys and I were dry camping on a plateau above one of the many canyons in the Snake River wilderness in late summer. The first night at about 1 a.m., we saw several lights rise into the sky which seemed to be about 10 miles away. We immediately thought it was just drones and thought nothing of it. Then we started seeing flashing amber lights reflecting off of the canyon walls. So naturally, my curiosity compelled me to see what was going on. We got in the truck and started driving down the only road in the area, hoping that we could get close enough to see. After about 30 minutes, everything went dark and we never saw any more lights. We never did find out what it was. On the second night, we had just gotten to sleep when I was woken up by wolves howling. At that point, I wasn't scared at all. I was just kind of fascinated by the sounds. They seemed pretty far off and it was cool to listen to. I drifted back to sleep and then some time later was woken up by the sounds of running animals. I bolted upright just in time to see several animals that looked to be wolves, hard to tell by moonlight through a tent screen though, running right past our truck. They never stopped, just a dead run past us. It's the only time I have ever seen wolves in the wild, and it was intimidating to see just how big they really are. But even with all of that excitement, that wasn't the scariest part of the night. About two hours after the wolf event, I had to get up to pee. I didn't even want to get out of the tent, but my bladder kind of forced the issue. I worked up the courage to get up, slung my gun around my shoulder, and stepped outside. I was about midstream when a thud and the sound of footfalls came from the area just to my right. I spun and drew my other gun in a full panic, only to realize that it was a cow rubbing against a small pine tree about 40 yards away. When I tell you I have never been so relieved to see a cow in my life. Other than the lights, the other things were explainable if not still exciting, but I don't think I'm going to forget that trip anytime soon. So I'm stargazing with my wife, and we're both in an extreme state of unease. We both look at each other and we say, something isn't right here. I'm looking into the pines, looking for the reason of our fear, and I see this orange cat sitting on a stump. The way it looked at me scared me, but I didn't really focus much on the cat. Suddenly through the trees, we hear this screaming. Help me, please, anyone out here? It sounded like a little girl at first, but then it sounded like a grown woman. Somebody effing help me. It cut through my body. I have never been that fearful in my entire life. I was completely terrified. My wife yells out, where are you? You're not alone. No reply. We get into our pathfinder, roll the windows down, and we have spotlights out each side searching for this woman. A couple more screams let out into the still night. She sounds like she's within 10 feet, but there's nobody around. We yell out to try to let her know that we're there, but we never get a reply. A scream so loud then happens and it leaves my eardrums ringing. Somebody please help me. It's like she's screaming directly into the car, but no one is anywhere. This scream was different because it sounded fearful, but also angry, and it really genuinely hurt my ears. That was the last one. 
We kept searching, but not another peep. Her voice was just not natural. I don't even know how to explain it. I am haunted by this experience, and honestly, I'm just looking for answers on what that was. I get chills when I talk about it. It almost makes me teary-eyed. This is probably completely unrelated, but in the same stretch of woods the day before, I was hiking and I came across an owl. I thought it was a decoy, like a prop or something, until it turned its head around and gazed deep into my eyes. I froze. I wasn't exactly fearful, but it had a strange effect on me. Its eyes were orange, bright, almost glowing. We locked eyes for what seemed like minutes, and then it flew off without a sound. I'm a bit mystified by what happened to me. I was out with a friend and the two of us were descending downhill from an old fortress. Just as the sun came down behind the mountain, everything went completely and utterly silent. One minute the birds were singing and chirping like crazy, and the next, dead silence. It was like somebody flipped a switch. You could only hear the wind rustling the dead and falling leaves. It took us a few moments to really notice the silence, before the silence almost became loud and noticeable. We kind of looked at each other and stopped to listen for a bit. And after a while, something that sounded like a flute could be heard coming from farther downhill. Every minute or so we'd hear it. Five to six second intervals, nothing complex. It lasted maybe 10 minutes, and then it suddenly stopped. After a while, we could hear birds and bugs and small animals again, even cars in the distance. But during those minutes we heard the flute, everything went deadly silent. The nearest wolves and bears and things like that are nowhere in this area. And there was just that odd music in the silence. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out what in the world we experienced. My best friend, I'll call her Gray, and I wanted to hang out, so we decided to go for a hike. I chose a reservation that I had been to multiple times before so that we could still have hope of navigating through the long trails in case we got lost. In hindsight, it was a pretty strange decision to go hiking, considering that it was mid-February in New England and it was still pretty cold out. This day in particular was especially foggy and colder than we had expected. We took the bus to the northern entrance of the reservation and headed toward the southern entrance, about a four and a half hour long trail. This was Gray's first time visiting the reservation, so she was attempting to take photos along the way. I say attempting because whenever she took her phone out, she would manage to snap a few photos before her phone would shut off and restart, probably because of the cold. My phone wouldn't even turn on at all. Nearing the end of the trail, we come across an extremely picturesque setting. A large barren tree with a wooden swing attached to the largest branch on the edge of a frozen foggy pond. The first people we see since we arrived was a man swinging a little girl, probably about four years old, wearing a bright pink jacket. We get closer and Gray manages to take a handful of photos before her phone repeats the cycle of death. She tells me that she wants to swing after they leave, so we wait patiently, giving them enough space to not ruin their moment. Not even 10 minutes into waiting, we notice that the man has stopped pushing the little girl and instead is just standing there, staring straight at us without any expression on his face. Gray and I turn around to avoid the creepy eye contact for a few seconds. And when we turn back around, the man is coming straight at us on an all-black unicycle. 
Gray screams, and right before he would crash into us, he makes a sharp turn straight into the woods. I will never forget how creepy this man's face was. He had absolutely no emotion at all, and literally looked pale as a ghost, almost green in the face. We look back at the little girl to see her struggling to run after him, eventually disappearing into the woods as well. Gray and I debated on going after the little girl for a while, but decided not to since neither of our phones were turning on and we still had about a half an hour to reach the southern exit of the reservation. I start pushing Gray on the swing, and as we're trying to dissect what just happened and where this man got a unicycle from, something across the pond catches my attention. I can barely see it through the fog, but quickly realize from the bright pink color that the little girl was watching us from between the trees. What makes us even crazier is that the man and the little girl disappeared into the woods heading east, and the other side of the pond was west of where Gray and I were. This little girl did not have nearly enough time to have gone all the way around without either of us noticing. I pointed out to Gray, and she immediately jumps off the swing, and we both start running to the exit without exchanging a word until we're in the clear. We walked about another 45 minutes until we reached civilization again and found a place to go eat. We go in and Gray plugs her phone into an outlet so that it can turn back on, and we look through all the photos. All the photos from the day are there, except the last four photos that she took of the man and the little girl. In their place were just plain black thumbnails with an error message that read, file not found. To this day, we can't make any sense of that situation. I went back to that reservation several times afterwards. I tried avoiding that pond at all costs. The one time I did revisit the pond area was because of a dare with a group of friends, only to discover something equally as strange. It was about 9 p.m. and completely dark, and there was a group of about 20 to 30 people having a picnic in what looked like colonial era clothing. We kind of creeped on them for a few minutes and decided to just head back before they noticed us. But the fact that they were having a picnic without any sort of lights or lanterns in the middle of the woods was pretty weird. I'm still not really sure what's going on at that pond, but I don't think I'll be going back anytime soon. So, I'm doing this challenge this year where I'm hiking at a new location every week. Yesterday, I was hiking with my friend in East Texas. He has indigenous blood, and so he's very sensitive to spirits. Anyway, we were a mile and a half into this trail, deep in the woods. It's Tuesday, around noon, so this state park is empty. I start seeing shadows of animals, I'm assuming. First, a white furry animal to my left then a large black shadow, about knee height, of what looked like a boar in front of me. I told my friend, and he just said, oh, that's weird. We walk a couple more steps, and he sees a person ahead, but there's no one there. At least I didn't see it. We brush it off, whatever. Maybe our eyes are playing tricks on us, and when he looks again, he can't see the person either. We move on. And then, all of a sudden, the air around us starts to feel super heavy and dark. Both of our chests start feeling tight, and there's pressure in the air. We both started hearing voices of people chattering on the other side of the wall of trees to our left. I was assuming that it was a campsite, because this park has so many campsites everywhere. We turn the corner of the trees, and literally no one is there no campsite either. We both looked at each other and said our own protective prayers and kind of booked it out of there as fast as we could. It felt like we had stepped through a dark curtain or portal of some sort, because when we passed that little river and creek, everything felt lighter, 
The weight was lifted off our chests, and we had to stop and breathe and kind of reassess what had just happened. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this, but it was definitely odd. I live in upstate New York, and my town has a wooded area that's known to be haunted. We have something in there that all the locals call the werewolf. No one knows what it really is, and bigger animals like wolves and bears don't really live in the area. We just have deer and other smaller animals. But a few of my friends and I have experienced it before, and all our experiences have been practically identical. I don't think it's flesh and blood, but it's huge and darker than dark. As in, when it's pitch black outside, you can still see its outline. My last experience with it was two years ago. It was during the summer, and a friend and I decided to take a walk through the woods. We didn't leave early enough, though, and by the time the sun had set, we still had about a half a mile walk out of the area. The closer we got to the tree line, noises started picking up. First it was twigs breaking behind us. Then it sounded like a huge branch had been ripped off a tree and thrown. My friend and I stopped and turned around, and we saw what looked to be a massive black shadow move behind a tree. My friend screamed and took off, so of course I followed. After running down the little embankment to the tree line, we stopped to catch our breath, and I turned on my phone flashlight so we could see properly. My friend opened her mouth to say something, but then twigs started snapping around us again. She grabbed my arm, and we both stopped breathing practically, probably out of fear. The snapping twig sounds kept getting closer and closer, so I shined the light into the trees. I saw, dead on, a black mass or shadow move to the right out of the beam of light. And then we heard a low, guttural growl just a few feet behind us. We both screamed and started sprinting, finally getting out of the woods. We ran to her car and jumped in, slamming the doors shut, gasping for air. We looked behind us to see if anything had followed, but we didn't see anything, thankfully. That's it, really. But all the stories I know of people who have experienced the werewolf all say practically the same thing. It's a massive shadow that stalks you. You can hear and see it trailing you. It growls, and it chases you to the tree line where it then seemingly backs off. Could it be a wolf or a bear? Sure, I guess but I've lived here my entire life. And in almost three decades, my town has never once sighted a wolf or bear in the area. So, who knows? Not too long ago, maybe four years, I was walking with my family on this trail. We did this often just as a family activity, and this time we decided to walk along a new trail. After we walked for a bit, my father saw some rubble in the distance and said we should go check it out. We walked up to it, and it appeared to be stone buildings, very decayed and barely intact. Just half of one of each walls was standing, Enough to tell what the building could have been, but nowhere near an intact structure. But then off in the distance a little bit, I noticed a staircase. The same type of stone, but somehow completely different. This staircase looked as though it hadn't aged at all. Completely disregarding this, I stepped on them and I walked up to the top. I looked around and saw nothing else. I told my father to come up but he said that I should come down. And then I remember feeling this weird feeling. 
I was filled with dread, mingled with a feeling of being lost. I came down and we walked a little bit more before leaving. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned this to my friends and they insisted that we go to check it out. I brought them to the ruins, but they were gone. I know I went to the exact spot, but it was like they never existed. I am a 20-year-old male, and my buddies and I enjoy late-night walks on the trails within the various conservation areas in my region. We live in southwestern Ontario. Late last week, we decided to check out an area called Pleasant Valley. To my knowledge, this area has a deeply rooted history, with the Underground Railroad, Indigenous people, as well as the War of 1812. If I'm not mistaken, it's because of its proximity to Lake Erie. At least that's what I've heard. We entered the woods at about 2 a.m., and immediately upon entering, I was overcome with a bad feeling. After walking for some time, the feeling progressively worsened until we reached two bent trees in an X over the path. One of my buddies pointed out the fact that it was, quote, bad juju to go underneath, and we should just call it a night. We all felt watched, so we thought it was probably a good idea. As soon as we turn around and start to head back, the entire forest seemed dramatically quieter. We all hear a loud, distinctively human whistle behind us, almost like how you would call a dog over. There's no way that anybody could have been out there at that hour. There's no homes in close enough proximity for someone to just be out and about. We all ran and I was honestly terrified my friends and I are all relatively big guys and we're pretty comfortable in the woods, so it takes a lot to get us running. There was also this faint, unpleasant odor, kind of like rotting eggs as we left the forest, and it wasn't present when we initially entered. I don't know if that's related, but we just noticed it. Either way, weird night. I'd like to preface this particular event that happened to me in my youth by saying that I've experienced far more paranormal activity, looking back, than I had ever really taken the time to consider. That being said, I have more stories that I might share in the future, but for this one, I want to tell you about the strange woods of Maine. As a child growing up in the backwoods of Maine, I've heard my fair share of strange things in the night. Typically, it'll be coyotes hunting, or the prowl of another nocturnal creature. As a child, I was never particularly afraid of the dark, but I knew dangers lurked in the absence of light. So at night, I played indoors. During the daytime, however, there were never any restrictions. On one summer afternoon, I was riding my bike down the street that branched off my dead-end road. Our only neighbors were a relative and a couple of decent folks just down the way. Otherwise, quiet woods. I would make this ride quite often, as there was no town, but this stretch was fun to ride because I could pedal my heart out without having to slow down in order to veer. On this day, I made my normal round up the road, only to turn around and head back. I had an uneasy feeling on the ride up, which was the only abnormality. I felt like I was being watched. Something told me to look toward the woods on my right, and reluctantly, I did so. Deep in the woods, amongst the pines, I saw a black, almost liquid thing peer out from behind a tree. My heart dropped. I took off pedaling as fast as my feet would take me, keeping a steady eye on the woods to my right. This thing kept pace effortlessly, darting from tree to tree like some primordial ooze. 
It was either playing or stalking prey, and I wasn't about to stop and find out which. I was pedaling so hard I thought my chain would snap. I knew my uncle's house was approaching on the left. I spun out in the dirt, ditched the bike, and ran to his door, frantically knocking. I turned around to see if whatever it was would be making its way toward me, but I didn't see anything. My uncle opened the door, cigarette in his mouth, asking me what was wrong. I explained to him what I saw, but he grabbed a rifle and said, probably just a bear, with slight concern in his voice. I've never seen a bear move like that, I said, out of breath. Yep, he said. They'll do that. He peered through the blinds. To this day, I don't know what I saw, but something tells me my uncle sure did. It's been 20 years, and I've since lost contact with my uncle. Maybe someday I'll reach out and ask. My dad grew up in the 70s in a wooded area in Maine. It was a tiny neighborhood with woods surrounding the outer part. My dad had all sorts of unexplained activity in his mother's house, but this is the one that stuck with me. My dad was around nine or 10. He couldn't sleep. Right beside his bed was a window and he could easily look out it from his bed. He heard noises outside and he got excited because he thought it was a moose or some wild animal. So he whipped open the shade. There was no moose. Looking back at my father was a little boy his age, maybe a little bit younger. He wasn't sure exactly what he was seeing. It was very foggy, but it was undeniable that he was looking at a little boy, a little redhead boy with overalls on and one of those stupid propeller hats. My dad wanted to close the shade and pretend that he had never seen him, but he just could not look away. The boy smiled and waved and began to walk away, becoming harder for my dad to see. Eventually, the boy disappeared into the fog. It was dark and there was this thick fog it was easy for my dad to convince himself that he imagined the whole thing. I think little kids find it easier to convince themselves that nothing has happened, that they just have an overactive imagination. I mean, that's what adults always tell children anyway. My dad was over at a friend's house a few days later. They were outside shooting BB guns, normal kids in the 70s, freedom type playing. The friend's dad was working on a car my dad tells his friend this story, thinking that they would both laugh at how silly my dad was. My dad told the friend, but he didn't laugh. His eyes got wide and all the color drained from his face. The friend books it over to his dad. My dad panics a little bit, thinking that his friend was telling his dad that he was trying to scare him and that my dad would get in trouble for it. Instead, the boy runs up to his dad and says, Dad, Dad, he saw the boy with the funny hat too. This story happened three years ago when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there and my favorite thing was to go hiking 
although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin, so it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned. And nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on and luckily I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly there was a moment of silence in the woods absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back. I started walking faster and guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that, and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life. Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that.